One of the rarely discussed problems in long-duration spaceflight is the use and storage of cryogenic fuels. No spacecraft has used cryogenic fuels except within a few hours of launch. My name is Ben Pearson, I'm the Roadster Tracker, and today I would like to talk to you about this use of cryogenic fuels in deep space. This is the main fuel tank for the space shuttle. Notice the orange foam that is surrounding it. This foam is an insulated material which keeps the cold rocket fuel inside at a low temperature in order to prevent it from boiling away. This allowed the space shuttle to use the very cold fuel, liquid hydrogen and oxygen, in order to successfully launch it into orbit around the Earth. This is a picture of the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket only a few minutes prior to launch. Notice the white gas that is escaping out of the rocket. This gas is actually some of the fuel of the rocket, and it is purposely escaping from the system. What happens is some of the fuel inside of that spacecraft reaches a temperature that is high enough for it starts to boil. That boiling fuel has too much pressure, and that pressure must escape somehow. The fuel is deliberately released from the tank in order to prevent any kind of damage from happening. Note that both the upper stage and lower stage are letting go of gas during this clip. This will continue to happen even after the spacecraft has achieved orbit. The Centaur rocket upper stage using cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen was able to keep its pressure for about 7 hours and most cryogenic fuels must be used within 24 hours in order to be effective in the slightest bit. This is a storage tank for liquid hydrogen, which is a cryogenic material that needs to be kept particularly cold. A good cryogenic tank on the ground will only lose about 2.3% of its pressure per day. While this doesn't seem like much, for a mission of a duration of only one month, at this rate, using a very good tank such as the one you see here, one would have lost half of the rocket fuel that one started out with. This tank is also more effective than most of the ones that could actually be made into a rocket. It is able to use as much mass as it needs to, while a rocket must conserve mass and only use the minimal amount required. Given all of these difficulties with cryogenic fuel, why would we even use them in the first place? Well, simply put, cryogenic fuels are much, much better than anything else that we can produce. You can see here the cryogenic fuels in blue and the red ones that can be kept at room temperature. These are a couple of examples, but in general, this rule holds. Cryogenic fuels have a much higher ISP. ISP is the specific impulse, and is a measure of how efficient a rocket is. The higher the number, the better it is. While these differences might not seem significant, given rockets, they can be truly a major factor. You can see here the Tilkovsky rocket equation. While this equation might seem complex, the key thing to take away is the chart on the right. The fuel efficiency is the x-axis and its measure of efficiency is the y-axis. As the efficiency goes up, the effectiveness, as shown by the mass ratio, goes up exponentially. Thus, even a small change in this specific impulse can have a huge effect in how much mass one can make it to orbit. Few studies have really been done to determine how effective rocket fuel can be stored for long durations. Most of the tests that have been done were done during the Altair program in the early 2010s. The Altair program was a mission to go to the moon. Thus, most of the tests have been done using lunar conditions. Martian conditions should be slightly more favorable than conditions on the moon. However, they will still have many of the same problems. NASA was testing two fuels of note. Most were done using liquid hydrogen, which is the most common rocket fuel that can be safely and effectively used. However, they also did tests using liquid methane. This is of particular note because liquid methane has some interesting properties, such as the ability to be manufactured on the surface of Mars easily. The test was scheduled to run for six months, however, it ended in only 77 days because the fuel was escaping more quickly than they would have preferred. Similar tests have been done with liquid hydrogen and found the duration to only be 21 days that it could be effectively stored. In my opinion, this is one of the greatest challenges that SpaceX has in getting to Mars, 
that has not been publicly addressed. This really won't be much of a problem getting to the surface of Mars, but in returning from the surface of Mars, it will be a significant hurdle. The spacecraft will have to stay on the surface of Mars for a period of up to 18 months. While not all of that time it will be fully fueled, it will be required for it to be fueled mostly, and it cannot simply vent fuel into deep space, such as is done commonly with rockets today. I'm not sure how these problems will be addressed by SpaceX, but I look forward to hearing how SpaceX and Blue Origins and other rocket companies planning on making ventures into deep space plan on addressing the cryogenic fuel problem. Feel free to check out some of my other videos on exploring Mars. I have a whole series of these that is coming out. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have, and until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.